you're going to do for us on the show today. Mm -hmm. You're gonna you're gonna present it. Okay. Yeah. Shall I go now? Please. <coughs> <coughs> when mommy said always listen to your elders, she never told me there were exceptions like brother as I fondly called him. Kind, affectionate who hugged me like daddy, kissed me on the cheek like mommy, swept me off my feet to let me fly. It's a pleasure to welcome you once again to our regular program, The Conversation. Reaching you from our studios at Kaftan Television in Abuja. And the conversation today will be centered around somebody I would describe as beauty and brain. She's brilliant, she's lovely to see, and she's a loaded package. It's going to be a very interesting time today. Okay, bit by bit, I'm going to unveil our guest in the studio who's right here with me. I'll tell you first of all that she is a graduate of the Nigerian Defense Academy, NDA. She holds a master's degree in conflict resolution. She's also an advocate for social justice. She is, in addition to all this, the chairperson of the Young Lawyers Forum of the Nigerian Bar Association, NBA um, of Garki One. It's my pleasure to have in our studio today, Zule Hat. Oh, Harry, Zule Hat, you are very welcome. Thank you, thank you. That was a beautiful introduction <laughs> of a beautiful lady that you are. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, let's dive straight into... Oh, I forgot to also tell you that she is the special assistant. She was the special assistant to the immediate past minister for youth development. So I think we're going to start right from there. Um, tell us some of the things that you know that were on your table that time that you were handling towards um, reforms, like you were telling me just before we went on air, especially in the area of the NYSC National Youth Service. Give, give us a feel of what that was like and the things you were able to do. Okay, um, so it was a sh uh, it was quite a short one, but um, an impactful one actually. So I had the opportunity to serve as a member of the NYC Reforms Committee and um, we were tasked with seeing how to make sure that NYC can equally be self-sustainable in terms of finances because as you know one thing we face in the country right now is finance. Cash crunch. Cash crunch, exactly. <laughs> and then you know NYC is mostly focused on the youth so why not see how to um, make NYC equally a, I don't call it a cash producing institution or something, but you know, let them be able to sustain themselves financially, even, and then they just expect maybe little support from the federal government. And um, in doing that, we had about two or three months um, to, to get that done, to come up with recommendations. And it was, I would say we came up with very beautiful recommendations because we had the opportunity of submitting those recommendations before, you know, um, she left office. Okay. And um, one of the things we wanted to look at was um, the fact that NYC actually has some ventures under it and then um, we looked at how we could expand these ventures and equally have um, more of um, the private public partnerships to run these ventures and um, so it's, it's, it would have served as a skills development um, for the uh, couples yes. while equally you know being a way for them to generate, um, generate funds mm -hmm. and then we're also looking at how to improve the skills in itself of the couples because then between the university and the job market NYC is where you have in the middle and one of the things that NYC is supposed to do is to equally give you the opportunity to develop some personal skills professional skills that they can take out you know into the job market and that has been kind of lacking in a way um, so what we also wanted to look at was how to equally um, see what partnerships we could pull in or you know that the NYC would be able to pull in to improve the skills 
of coppers so that they are not just viable for the national market, even in the international market. Okay. So, yeah, those were the main things. Okay, so it would be very nice then for the federal government to want to, um, if not call some of you back, then at least adopt some of those resolutions because... They, to me, they all sound really, really useful. I remember when I was a couple, we were just goofing around. <laughs> we were working in a media house, and I mean, you know, you just couldn't wait for a closing time to go back and just yes. goof around. If we, you know, if we knew then, back then, what we knew now would have improved on some of, like, some of those skills. And of course. Those would have been different streams of income, and that would have been a buffer instead of, you know, like, Exactly. Calling home all the time. <clears throat> they haven't paid a la wheel. We are broke. And that kind of thing would have been out of the window. Exactly, so that's actually. a really great one you're doing. Okay, then you also said that you're very much into international um, dispute, well, not international, but alternative dispute resolution. Have you had any hands-on um, experience with that? Like maybe... Mm. <laughs> okay, so for us on experience, I'll say no. Okay. I've mostly um, taken the courses and, um, shall I say, resolved conflicts in more in the local setting. Okay. For me, it's more of a skill development. Mm -hmm. It's a skill set I felt that I needed to develop as a lawyer okay. because then we go into courts all the time. Yes. Um, there's always the litigation aspect, and sometimes mm -hmm. that makes you a little aggressive. But um, building my skills in alternative dispute resolution was a way for me to see beyond litigation yes. as the only form you know of resolving conflict mm -hmm. and that was one of the reasons I equally took a master's program in conflict resolution and peace building okay. because then you will think when you hear conflict resolution and peace building they are one and the same with alternative dispute resolution but then they are not okay. you know um, alternative dispute resolution still you, you could still put it in terms of the um, legal profession oh, you know Okay. It's an alternative way of resolving conflict outside litigation. But conflict resolution in itself is broader. In fact, um, conflict resolution and peace building are two different um, entities entirely. Um, peace building processes are what comes after conflict resolution and they take longer. And, um, you know, we, I don't think, I think in most part of Nigeria and most of the states in Nigeria, you'd always find out that we have a lot of conflicts going on from communal conflict True. to even politics, ethnic conflicts and all of that. Yeah. And I think um, some of these are conversations we need to have more often. How do we begin to resolve these conflicts? Mm -hmm. How do we find what the root causes of these conflicts are mm -hmm. and then begin to um, have peace building processes yeah. um, that would be acceptable to the reality of those communities okay. you know that they can also key into mm -hmm. um, for a sustainable you know peaceful resolution mm -hmm. um, so yes I think um, it's, it's for me it's it's been a beautiful journey I've actually been learning a lot mm -hmm. and um, I've actually had to apply it in my leadership roles and you know in the course of work mm -hmm. and I would say everyone should have a skill um, a conflict resolution skill it is of utmost importance if you ask me I think it should be taught in every school yeah. that should be a core course Okay. Um, does it is it should it usually be pre litigation or, or post or, or like for instance should it be should we first go to where there's conflict resolution um, avenues and then proceed to court or should it be court first or oh, look we we just have to what should really what would you recommend for instance like in a community where there are, um, maybe conflicts over a land boundary and stuff like that shouldn't that be handled legally or should it just be should we go for the peace building aspect first okay so you know like i said there are two different things yeah mm -hmm. but here's the thing for litigation um litigation is such that one person always comes out angry Mm -hmm. because there's always a loser. I wouldn't want to use the word loser, but then there's always the winning side in litigation. And sometimes um, parties wouldn't, you know, the other party wouldn't feel the judgment is just, you know. Um, so I would say that we should explore more of conflict resolution and peace building because litigation wouldn't go back to the root cause of the issue. For every conflict you see, there's actually a root cause to it. In fact, um, let's say you and I are having a conflict, yeah? And um, somebody asks you, oh, 
why are you doing this? Why is this an issue? Sometimes the reason you may give may not even necessarily be the main reason for that conflict. I could just say, oh, I'm angry because this person did this to me. And then you come to me also and I say, oh, I'm angry because this person reacted this way to me. But then the beauty of conflict resolution now is that you're able to look beyond what the parties are just saying, yes, to understand the history behind it, mm -hmm. behind that conflict, yes. and address it from, like I said, the root cause of it. Because mm -hmm. when you now understand, sometimes it could be something very little mm -hmm. that has grown into something more. Uh, you know, um, and then it's now even spread. It could even be a family feud yeah. that has gone into a communal conflict. True. So sometimes when you are able to trace what those issues are yeah. and you're able to address them from the root causes, then it's easier for you to um, resolve this conflict in a way that both parties will be okay. Um, but for litigation, it's not like that. And then you find out that there's always a relapse sometimes because then courts would give judgment, yes. But then to me, it's, it sometimes leads to more issues. So it will depend on the situation, you know, what the cause of the conflict is um, and all of that. There are some situations that are obviously better left for the court to decide, especially in terms of business mm -hmm. um, work and all that. And then where even the federal government is involved. And, but when we talk about people, Yes. community because i'm big on community i actually believe that if we have um unity within the communities then we would have strength um stronger institutions because you know um you would agree with me that even when we use the broom analogy once the broom is scattered then what impact can it have what can you sweep what can you clean but then when the broom is together it's even hard to break it can do more. So for me, I'm big on community. And so that's why I'm equally big on the, you know, areas of conflict resolution and yeah. peace building. Yeah. Because even when you resolve these conflicts, no you need peace. to keep putting structures in place to mm -hmm. make sure that that conflict you have resolved stays. Right. Because anything can come up. You know, conflict is very fragile. Anything True. can come up and there's a relapse. Mm -hmm. So the idea of peace building now is we resolve this conflict, how yeah. do we ensure that it stays this way yes. and it even gets better? Yes. And so peace building is a continuous process. Okay. It's, it's not something you just put there and you don't go back to revisit. Mm -hmm. You change it according to the realities because then the society is dynamic. People change every day. Okay. Our needs change every day. So you actually have to continue putting together peace building processes that would, like I said, reflect the current realities of people. Uh, from what you've seen so far, is Nigeria doing that? For instance, in these areas, let me take a uh, right off my head, we'll take a state like Zamfara, which is being, you know, uh, pummeled by all these terrorists and killers and all that. Okay, having moved all these people who are victims to the IDP camps and trying to rebuild their lives, do you see elements of peace building and stuff like that being put into place? Are there systems like that that you see? Because, frankly, I don't. And frankly, I agree with you. <laughs> I don't. But at the same time, uh, well, I can't speak for the federal government. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't know if some of these things are in place, but maybe they are not just um, obvious to us. Because one thing you should also understand is that we have a lot of um, partners you know, that sometimes come in to assist, um, you know, government, okay. uh, non-government agencies, you mm -hmm. know, international partners and all of that. And one of the things, you know, I learned while in school was that um, you have the peace building from above and the peace building from below. And most times what we have in Nigeria is peace building from above, which is when you take what they, you know, um, other partners. So, you know, we do get international aid grants and all of that. And they also have a way of resolving their conflict, yes. And then sometimes we tend to adopt these methods without necessarily considering the fact that we are not them. Our cultures, what we understand, how we relate are not the same as how they relate. So, and that's where peace building from below comes in. Peace building from below is when you consider the cultures of the people, what is acceptable to them. You know, it would, well, I think this is something everybody would know, but um, if we probably have, um, were good with keeping up with history, you find out that every culture in Nigeria did have a 
conflict resolution system back yeah. then. Exactly. And it was acceptable to the people, regardless of how people may view it now. And um, I feel like even if we were coming up with peace building processes now, we're adopting it because we feel, oh, these people have more research going on for them. We equally owe it to the people to carry out research from the grassroots to understand mm -hmm. what is acceptable to these people and then mm -hmm. marry it together. Mm -hmm. And that way you come up with a better solution. And I yeah. think that's where we may be getting it wrong. Okay. The fact that we're not considering what is acceptable to the people. The government mm -hmm. sometimes just comes in and say, oh, one let's size move them. Mm -hmm. And it's not one, one size, size fits all. all. It's okay. not. It's never one size fits mm -hmm. all. Even within a family, it's mm -hmm. never the same treatment for this child or this child. Everyone has different needs. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, the government does have the responsibility of ensuring that proper research is done mm -hmm. when, you know, they are trying to resolve. Because I would say, you know, they are trying their best, mm -hmm. yes. Um, but then, you know how it is. So sometimes your best is not good enough if you're not doing it the right way. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So, what did I pick from that? I think it, uh, I think I learned um, unity, unity in community. Let's take that as one of our takeaways today from our erudite guest. Okay, Zulayhat, you are now as um, an advocate for social justice. Um, do you, do you work in any legal chamber at the moment? Yes, um, uh, okay. I've, I'm working with Aliu Saiki, SCN okay. and Co. It's an it's an SCN law office. Okay. Yes. Um. Uh, well, it's mostly a litigation law office. Okay. So that's all mostly done. Okay. But then, um, so, um, how are you able to like uh, bring to bear your advocacy, like for social justice, maybe in some of these um, cases where you litigate upon? Okay, so um, for me advocating for social justice, to be fair, I'm not the court court person. Um, in fact, I would say the idea of being an advocate started while I was still in university. So um, I was a member of a particular um, organization that is the Putas Children Global Foundation. Mm -hmm. One of the things we did then was trying to get children off the streets to schools because, you know, um, what we have right now in terms of let's use the terrorist groups and all of that, why they're able to attract members is because then you have children just everywhere doing nothing and it's easy to entice them with little things. And so um, from there on, I saw the impact of taking even if it's just one person off the streets. And then, so I think God has been guiding my path all this while because um, while I was in camp, yeah. um, you know, a lot of people are always trying to work where they are going to for camp. They're always looking for, oh, where do I want to work? Where do I? And yeah. for the first time in my life, I told myself, you know what? I don't want to be the one to decide where I want to go. I don't even want to have to stress about it. Let me see where I'll be posted to. And <laughs> I was actually posted to an NGO, Partners West Africa, Nigeria. And um, I worked yeah. with um, It's in Jabi. Okay, in Abuja. Um, yes. Okay. So basically, they had this... Um, Project reduction of pretrial detention in Nigeria. Oh, beautiful! Yes, and then I was posted to a police station. <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> so what was so 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 the seat okay. And the uh, first time I I went to the office yeah. to you know okay, so I was posted to you. What what am I supposed to do? Because <laughs> I was ready to say, please, I can't do this job. I just wanted to know what it was about. The reason I even went in the first place was because it was an NGO, and I know that's already an area I was interested in. And then when they mentioned, oh, you would have to be reporting to a police station, I'm like, no! Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> and um, so I just, went, well, I gave it a chance. Mm. I said, okay, what is it about, really? Yeah. And then when I heard the reason why I have to be in the police station, it didn't seem like a bad idea because, you know, for me, it's the impact, yes? And so I was like, let's give it a try. And so for my service here, I spent 90% of my time at the police station. And mind you, before then, I had this, um, you know, I think it's a general thing amongst Nigerians and the police, especially being a lawyer and being posted to a police station, those issues, the love-hate relationship we tend to have. So I was worried about fitting in. But to be fair, to date, I still call the officers there to check on them. <laughs> Because you know, um, it's not to be good. It's not to be good. You know, I I got to really see 
even their plight. In fact, at a point, I started fighting for them. Mm -hmm. I would be the one outside, and people would say, oh, police are this, and I'll start defending them. I said, no. Mm -hmm. If you haven't been with them, yeah. you wouldn't understand. But then there was a lot of impact we were able to make, because, okay. you know, just in Garaki Police Station alone, we were able to refer over a hundred detainees Yes, um, to lawyers. Exactly, because what we did was, I'm in the police station. Mm -hmm. I'm supposed to have access to the cell okay. to interview suspects that are brought in, mm -hmm. you know, that are detained there. Okay. And um, if if they do not have, you know, access to legal representation, yes. then I get in touch with legal aid or the, um, you know, the office, and they get a lawyer to come in and take their cases. Okay. So because basically, one of the problems we faced in terms of um, prison congestion and all of yes. that is that from the police station you take these people to court mm -hmm. they do not have legal representation there's no there's no one to you know ask for bail for them and yes. all of that and usually from there they are taken to the prisons okay. and sometimes they are forgotten them mm -hmm. but then having someone representing you means that you actually have a chance to get bail sometimes even from the police station yeah. and then before you go to court okay. and even while at the court if you really have to go to you know prison for the and all of that um, you have a lawyer following up your case to okay. make sure that you get out on time so to be fair there was a lot of impact and mm -hmm. even after service I actually still volunteered with them for an extra two years okay. so it wasn't until last year mm -hmm. that I uh, last year March mm -hmm. that I actually stopped you know working with them because then I had to move really to other things I had to focus more of my time yeah. on other endeavors but okay. It, it was beautiful, I would say. Okay. You know? um, I just wanted to ask, were those um, like hardcore cases or were they like, like would, would you be handling things like people who committed things like murder and that kind of a thing? Okay, so you know, you know, um, for the police divisions, mm -hmm. yes, um, they have the they have a restriction to the type of cases they can handle. Mm -hmm. Yes, so oh, some okay. of the hardcore cases are taken to you know the state CID for oh, CID okay. and all of that, and that's where you have them going to the high court and all of that. But yeah. most of the cases we handled were mostly um, matters that ended up in magistrate court okay. or the um, upper area court, right. and. Um, but you know despite that mm -hmm. in fact you find out that sometimes a lot of the detainees there it always mm -hmm. starts from there so it yeah. starts from the smaller court and okay. all of that um and another thing i wanted to ask were there were you were there mostly young people or just cut across men women old young i'll tell you mostly young people mostly sometimes young you people. have the petty oh. okay. you know the phone snatchers, yeah. yeah, you have all that. Um, you have the junkies, mm. you know. And to be fair, they were mostly young people. Oh, no. There are times I got emotional. Yeah, to no. be fair, because I'm, I'm it's I'm sad and already. <laughs> it, it was a tough job, mm. I would say. It was, but it toughened me too, mm. because you know, um, you just get around to understanding that you you're you're fortunate mm. because sometimes i understand that society is failing the young ones because exactly. we're exactly. not we're just not doing enough we're for not the doing young enough people and then that. we're not even creating spaces for them to grow mm -hmm. you know just look at the like for instance we don't even need to snap our hands graduate unemployment already so i finished school finish my nyc and start moving. I start running around looking for work. We're not doing enough. Okay, well, I think you, though, are doing enough. <laughs> Let me see. What else on this your thinking cap? I don't want to I don't want to tell you people the next part. I'm reserving that for after the break because okay. she has spoken word to her. So we'll talk about that. Let's just look at the, the conflict resolution, the legal aspect of things for now. Let me see. Um, chair, Young Lawyers Forum, MBA. Okay, as chair, chair, I mean, chair congratulations. Oh, they always call me chairman, but please, yeah, chair person. Yeah, no, I just call you chair, chair. All right, Young Lawyers Forum, MBA. Is that like, is that like a, a branch or, you know, like we have FIDA, which will represent female lawyers. Mm -hmm. Is that what, is that what yours is about? Like the Young Lawyers Forum. Let's, let's know what yeah. exactly are you representing within the legal so it's uh, a fora. association okay. it's a fora. um mm -hmm. so in the nba we have the nba as an association mm -hmm. we have sections in okay. the nba and then we have forums in the nba so for the young lawyers forum 
it's actually um, you know one of those for us. So we have the national level. Mm -hmm. We have the National Young Lawyers Forum executives mm -hmm. that um, are supposed to oversee the well-being of all the young lawyers, okay. you know, all over. And then every branch to you know equally have their own Young Lawyers Forum. Every so, branch. Yes, oh, every branch. Okay. So for me, I'm in Gariki branch. Okay. Yes, and then you know, as God will have it, <laughs> I was made the chairperson of the Young Lawyers um, Forum for my branch. So okay. basically, myself and my executives are responsible for the well-being and the development of the Young Lawyers in my branch. Okay. Um, How long is your tenure for? Oh, two years. So I'm there to 2026. Two years? That's just as long as the NBA president himself. Yeah, actually, it's, it wow. runs the same. Oh, yes. it runs the same? Yes, it runs the same. Wow, wow, wow. Okay. So what and what and what and what and what are you planning to do? A lot. Yeah, tell us. <laughs> tell us six. Six. Okay. How <laughs> can okay, no, tell us three? No, I can. I can go on and on about that yeah, because okay. I'm a very ambitious person. So yeah. sometimes, you know, my plans are ambitious, but I always say, if it doesn't scare you, then it's not. You know, it's not big enough. Yeah, it's a um, challenge. So one of the things I mentioned um, upon taking responsibility was the fact that I wanted to focus on. Uh, mentorship, internship, and skills development of young lawyers. Mm -hmm. And why that is, is because um, you notice that young lawyers are being taken advantage of sometimes because they're out of law school, fresh out of law school. They do not have the job experience. You know, it's one thing to um, be taught law in school, but it's another thing to have the practical experience of it. So um, for me, I felt, why not find a way to improve their skills? Yes, um, let's find avenues, maybe through partnerships for them to have these internships and all of that. So they equally have some, somewhat some job experience. Right. And then that gives them confidence to negotiate value, you know, for their work. Right. When, when meeting employers and mm. all of that, because that's like I said, it's something we're really lacking, you know, in the NBA. And to that, um, thankfully, the branch executives have been with us on it. In fact, we actually have a, um, a scheme coming up soon, the um, NBA Garaki branch Young Lawyers Internship and um, Skills, um, Internship and Training Scheme. So it's supposed to focus, as the name suggests, on internship and skills training. But okay. then from the YLF, we actually are taking on majorly the mentorship area of things. Okay. And um, another thing I'm trying to do is to open, you know, that pathway to the development space. I actually think and I've always believed that young lawyers have a huge role to play in the development space. If we're talking about development space, it even goes to the development of our country and even the world in general. And um, most times, um, apart from the, young, the lawyers generally that already work maybe in the legal departments in some of these organizations that have an idea, um, as an association, we don't, you know, as Young Lawyers Association in particular, we don't really pay so much focus on that. And that's one area I'm really trying to bring to fore, you know, within the next two years. I'm trying to see how we can develop partnerships with um, international partners, local NGOs, you know, and all of that. And let's begin to give back to the society. Um, sometimes it's just even the low-hanging fruit. You know, um, like going out and educating people on their basic human rights. That shouldn't have to be the job of non-lawyers, to be mm -hmm. fair. We are at the forefront of some of the SDG goals, like the SDG 15, which is um, on strong institutions and all of that. And I, like I told you, I'm being big on community. So how better or what better way to do this if you can't go out, you know, directly as an association and tell people that, you know, these are your rights. You know, so people do not take advantage of you. These are where you should go when you have issues like this. These are where you should go when you have issues like this. Have conversations with local governments and, you know, MDAs to say, you know, things are going wrong in terms of some policies. This is, you know, these are our recommendations and all of that. That is us still playing a key role as lawyers, yeah, in the development space. Because right. to me, it's, it's, it's enough that it's always about us. Yeah. Let's now begin to make it about the people as well. Right. Okay, well, this conversation is not ending right here. We're just going to go on a very short break. So just stay with us and we will also be staying with Zula Ahad and as we continue on the conversations on Kaftan TV. 
You're very welcome back, and it's still the conversation on Kaftan Television. And we are having this conversation with our erudite legal practitioner in the person of Zulaihat O'Hare, who is the current chairperson of the Young Lawyers Forum, YLF, of the Nigerian Bar Association, Garki Branch. Now we're going to introduce you to another side of her because Zulaihat is actually a writer. She has been involved in the spoken word. She writes of um, poetry and she's also presented them. In fact, she's actually won uh, an award, a prize. She's been first runner-up in a spoken word competition. So right now, Zulaihat, you're going to take us on that journey to how you got involved in spoken word. What happened? Were you writing and then somebody stumbled upon it and said, oh, this is really good. Bring it out. Mm. Let's know your secrets because you, I can see, are destined for greatness. Thank Say you. amen. Amen. <laughs> okay. Uh, spoken words. So it started secondary school uh more particularly my ss1 i don't know i just took to writing and you, you, for someone like me who wanted to be a gynecologist and my mom really encouraged me on that path i found myself in science class um writing poetry <laughs> and um Suddenly, I found the fact, you know, I was losing interest in the science courses and all of that. And um, to be fair, I think I, that was the first time I, I made a mess of my results, you know, that year. And um, I, I already knew immediately after my results came out that, okay, maybe science isn't for me, especially given the direction I was already going. So I moved to arts class and I excelled there. Too well, in fact. Although I wasn't sure what I wanted to be back then. Because yes. imagine all my life I've thought of always being a gynecologist. Yes. And suddenly I'm moving to arts class. Yes. And I didn't know. And someone once said, oh, but you can be a lawyer. And I said, all lawyers are liars. <laughs> <laughs> and the person said, no, you can choose the type of lawyer you want to be. And I've always held on to that. Right. But moving on, um, so yes, I wrote a lot. And then while, when I moved to art class, I found myself in um, some um, clubs, like the, um, I think, what was it called? Is it poetry? Um, I can't even remember the name of the club. But basically, we, we, we used to go out for competitions, poetry recitations, and all of that. Yes, the book club. So we used to go out for poetry recitations. And because I could talk a lot, they always just felt... She's right for the job. So I found myself representing the school for some of these competitions and it kind of boosted my confidence. Okay. Yes. And then, but then I got to university. I, in fact, I had already written like 33 pieces as at secondary school. And then I got to university and um, one day I spoke to someone about it and he said, let me link you up with an editor, you know, um, someone in Kogi State back then. I think he, he used to write a magazine for Kogi State, Kogi Focus or something like that. And then he featured two or three of my pieces um, right there. And he even called my dad and he said, your daughter is gifted and you should really encourage her. May God bless his soul, Dr. Onukaba. He's late now. Um, but then... Dr. Adina Onukaba? Yeah. My goodness! Yes! Yeah. Yes. Oh, God bless his soul, like yes. you said. Wow. So, yes. That was not a chance meeting. You know that? <laughs> well. That was, that was fate at work. Yes. Wow. Okay. So, yes, he encouraged me to mm -hmm. be fair. And, you know, around that time, I started thinking of publishing. Yes. And then there was the issue of the funding. Mm -hmm. And before you knew it, I just dropped the matter. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, let's leave it. But then fast forward to university was over and... Um, I was already practicing law. I was too busy with life to even go back to it. But then sometime, um, you know, at a point I went back to some of the pieces I had written because I'm good at record keeping. And I was like, what even happened to this? And I said, you know what? Poems are no longer it right now. Maybe I should try spoken words because I'm a very expressive person. Right. And I think I do better with even writing than speaking. And then I started writing spoken words and it flowed even more for me because I was able to express a lot of things. For me, it was like a therapeutic thing. Right. And I always tell people that when you read my poems, some of them just tells you about me. While some, it's just me relating to other people's story. And so I did a recording first um, on a particular um, topic. What, I, what did I even call it? Um, it was an untitled piece of news, but it was pretty long. It, it covered the issue of ethnicity, politics, 
you know. And um, I, I would say that was an advocacy on my part because it was me just saying the truth, you know, the way we fight. Like, I don't know why I'm always drawn to such topics, but it was me just telling people that sometimes you really don't need to fight about this. But then we have this section yes. in NBA that is the section on business law. Mm -hmm. And then they usually ha they started a talent show last year. So they had like the first one last year. I wasn't even part of the section yet. Unfortunately, I joined this year. And then somebody sent, you know, the adverts to me for the Lawyers Got Talent 2.0. And I'm, I'm like, and then I'm seeing poetry or, you know, um, music, comedy. And I said, poetry and music cannot compete. <laughs> because we know people love music. How many people really re relate to poetry and spoken words? But someone said, why not just put in? And so I, I did a short piece for the audition. And um, to my surprise, I, I got a message. I was shocked. If I wasn't prepared for it, you know when you just say, let me do something and see how it goes. And it went well. And so I had to now prepare for the competition itself. And so I was so anxious. I was calling people mm -hmm. that had participated before. And I'm like, how was it done? What did you guys have to do? Yeah. Everything, everything. And so I had to prepare two different pieces. And so I said, okay, you know what? I'm going to speak on the Nigerian reality for the prelims. And then I'll speak on Childhood Shadows, which is a piece centered on abuse for the finals. And guess what? <laughs> On that day, we were 14 contestants, and I was the last contestant. And uh, when the show was going on, I could see people, to be fair, at the point I lost confidence in what I was going to do because I could already see talent, you know, amongst lawyers even, because they were all lawyers there. And I was like, how can I beat any of this? I, I knew some people there that were always going for competitions, even in spoken words. I meet them at ALS and all of that. But so what I just did though was I switched things up. What was supposed to go for my finals, I moved it to prelims. And then what was going for prelims, I moved it to finals because I knew that I had to just risk it and all of that. And um, I think that particular piece, Childhood Shadows, it moved a lot of people. Like I said, it was on abuse. It moved me to, if I was writing that piece, I was always crying because as an artist, I have put myself, you know, in certain positions to be able to write better. And I got a lot of feedback from it, a whole lot. You know, I came first from Arab anyways, with music still coming first. <laughs> but I got a lot of feedback. A lot of what did you win? Uh, 700,000 naira. That's, that's nothing to sneeze at. That's good. That's a nice one. <laughs> but you know what you're going to do for us on the show today? Mm -hmm. You're going you're gonna to present it. Okay. Yeah. Shall I go now? Please. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> when mommy said, always listen to your elders, she never told me there were exceptions like brother, as I fondly called him, kind, affectionate to hugged me like daddy, kissed me on the cheek like mommy, swept me off my feet to let me fly, only for me to come crashing down. But I loved inventing games, you see, so I was thrilled to play his version of hide and seek where he taxed me to seek his treasure stick hidden below his hips, hinting it was the key if I wanted to win. So imagine my shock when mommy screamed, muffled and frantic, shattered our innocent play as I reached out for brother stick during a family game of hide and seek. Confusion clouded my young mind, innocence fractured by secrets I didn't understand. Brother stick, hidden treasures, winning games, all became tainted, twisted by adult whispers, judging eyes that avoided mine and voices that hushed. As mommy's tears fell silently, brother's laughter turned hollow and I lost in a game I never chose to play. At least that is how I wish I remembered it, but in the memories that haunt me still, Mommy never cried. The voices were loud. She judged with her eyes, her hands that kept me warm now, cold as they topped away from this field that yours can't seem to conceal her. Words that once healed pierced me deep with nouns like I shall. I mean, I was just a child. So how was I to know that when mommy said, always listen to your elders, brother was an exception. The end.
Oh, I tried doing it too well. I'm sorry. <laughs> No, that was, I mean, that was, that means you can act as well, because that was really, 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 that was so emotive. And then it was, so, it conveyed all the meanings. I, and like you said, wow, such a betrayal of trust on so many levels, because even the, you know, the primary caregiver who should have now, you know, held such a person in their arms was now like turning the victim into an active participant whereas she was completely innocent but that's and the that reality of the, reality reality of the sad me. reality but that was a really great one i think you know you should you don't say oh well you know i'm just going to continue with my legal no 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 that you i think you should also pursue your spoken word talent well i'm doing because that because talent is you know like i said it's not it's something you're given but you have to um, like the Bible says, stir up the gift within you, which you are doing. I, I want to encourage you to continue. That was a great for me. A hundred thumbs up. I'm glad you won. Because I, I would have felt bad if somebody presented that and didn't win anything. That was a nice Thank one. You. Please continue. Okay, Dodo, what else? Apart from that, what do you do in your leisure time? Now you have so many hats on your head. Do you cook? Do you swim? Do you <laughs> athletic? <laughs> I'm laughing because I barely have leisure time. Yeah. But I used to enjoy cooking. Yeah. A lot. In fact, I made it a business at some point. I was running a home kitchen yeah. from university, 500 level, and during the COVID period, and my mom's kitchen turned to my business center. And I was making a lot of money. To be fair, that's sometimes I encourage young people that you need to look outside, you know, what the what government is offering mm -hmm. to, you know, because people were really patronizing me, despite the states of the country, that period. But then I went for NYC and I stopped having time for that. I've even done makeup before. Like, I've been a makeup artist at some point. Yes, I know. It's shocking to you. You know why it's shocking. I had, it's shocking. You see the little red lipstick on her face? I had to pin her down to put it on. What? <laughs> no, on a good day. Weddings, occasions, and all. I yes. don't wear makeup. Mm. makeup. But, you know, for me, I, makeup is not supposed to be an everyday thing. Yeah. You know, um, so, but, but right now, Leisure period, I just hang out with friends. Okay. Because that's the only time I have to create memories. Yes. And it's very little time. In fact, sometimes I'm even going with my laptop. And then at the point, I just feel, you know what, it's rude of you to actually be working when you should actually be spending time with people. So I just let it out, you know. So most times now, it's just... Before, work. before writing used to be a form of you know leisure for me, yes. but now it's turning into a serious thing yeah. for me mm -hmm. since I've decided to um, make it a form of advocacy because I have um, an album I'm trying to release an extended right. play, mm -hmm. um, and it's on it's on abuse, and um, in fact I even have an NGO that's supposed to take on um, you know a project on abuse using creative and performing arts because you would agree with me that spoken words and art is, is a soul thing. Yes. It's something that connects directly to the soul. So mm -hmm. if there is a way for us to speak to people for them to hear us sometimes, we need to look for other ways to channel some of these conversations. Can you tell us a little more about your NGO? What, what are your projections? What are your plans? Let's know everything okay. you have on ground. Okay, so... Um, what you're presenting later. Um, citizens initiatives for rights and empowerment okay. that's the name and um so we have four major core areas we're planning to focus on and you won't be surprised why i'm picking those areas anyways so we have conflict resolution <laughs> conflict resolution you have yes. peace building number two peace building you have social justice social justice yes. the last one will surprise you you have environmental justice oh it surprised me yes. <laughs> i had almost said the last one is going to be um um, uh, um, reduction in abuse. No, no, no. Mm -hmm. that is covered under social, social justice. justice yes. Okay. But environmental justice because a lot of people have conversations about climate change. Yes. But let me show you the link of you know why environmental justice over climate change and all those other topics, and that's because sometimes, not even sometimes, if you are asked today, what's the first thing men ever fought over? It's land. Yeah. And now. In all 36 states of Nigeria. I would say women. No, land, actually. <laughs> yes, so... Um, 
in all the things that you mentioned, <laughs> okay. including the FCT, mm. you actually have mineral deposits, lithium, gold. You, like you said, you mentioned Zamfara, and um, nobody is really talking about the impact of digging different spots. It's a good thing for the economy, but nobody is talking also about the conflicts that ensues from some of these things. Where there are mineral deposits, where you have some of these things, look at the Niger Delta, look what became of it. You have conflicts falling right behind it. For environmental justice, as an NGO, we're looking at focusing on advocating for safe mining systems, policies that would ensure safe mining systems, systems right? that would ensure that companies that are mining are not just doing it in a safe way so that those around the environment are not affected mm. negatively but that they also carry out the corporate social responsibilities to those places then environmental assessment in, uh, impact assessments That's first right. before you even because oh you find out there there's some deposit here mm, you just go into mining have you checked what the impact is i know like, have you checked about the people who were there before the original landowners, nothing. Nothing. So, you know, and for me, it's a conversation we need to start having more often. Right. Because greed comes in, it's human nature. With, but I just feel like it's very unfair that the very place you get gold from or you get minerals from are the places that are least developed. Just like the Niger Delta, exactly. the very place where you get oil from. It's the very place that. Uh, they do not have oil, they do not have they petrol, have safe they do not have, no, safe drinking water is too much to even ask for, they don't Some even have a place to live. So, so for me, that's, that's, you know, why environmental justice. For me, yes. everything I do nowadays yes. is, um, community-based and community-related. Yes. You know, um, so, so. Do you know that even just the way we, because of the, um, negligence in providing portable drinking water the way we all like get a building dig a borehole mm -hmm. it's actually wrong it's affecting the water table of every single city where people are gathered together not everyone and knows that no, and then the impact, the, like I said, the, the impact is not really what we're projecting. Just, oh, well, I've got to get my own, I've got to get my own borehole, I've got to get my tank, and that's it. It's actually it's actually having a negative impact. So we need to be going one to of pay for in the future. Yes, with the MDS, the proper agencies, we're telling them these are issues, these are problems, yes. this will develop into bigger issues in the future. Right. Now, whatever we do now, I believe we're doing it for the future generation. Right. We've had my grandparents, your grandparents, both right. grandparents fight for what we have now. Yeah. And I think it's equally our responsibility to fight for what our gen future generation right. will have. Instead we can't leave them. them. If, if we were left with, um, you know, a, a wasteland, we won't be here right now. Right. So why leave the future generation with the right. land? We, we can't do better. Right. But what are you going to do for funding for the NGO? Well, obviously, funding is always an issue. But yeah. then um, I'm hoping we can obviously leverage on partnerships. Okay. We already have some NGOs that if they are doing something around the areas we're considering, right. we could actually partner with them to right. amplify impact. Right. And then for NGOs that are not doing exactly what we intend to do, but are doing something slightly right. towards what we're intending to do, we can equally leverage on partnerships with them to okay. see how we can now steer the conversation towards where we want. And then we have international partners, international donors that we equally intend to leverage on. But all this, like I said, would um, definitely by the time you sit down and do your research, you find out that you have donors and partners who have certain areas of focus and so the idea is for us to try and key into those you know because it's about impact and that is right. what the funding they have is for it's for yes. impact right. so let's have a proper plan as to how we intend to implement some of these things okay. and then key into partnerships mm -hmm. right now you can't even do anything alone you know, you can't do anything. It's not a foundation where you say, oh, profits we're making from this business is going there. But one thing I also intend to do is for all the spoken words we're doing, right. you know, for all the productions we're doing, because, you know, we are looking at, like I said, advocating using creative and performing arts. Right. Um, there, are such, there are ways you can actually monetize them on social media. Right. And then I'm looking at all the funds coming in, you know, going into the NGO to right. directly. Okay. All right. Okay, um, I wanted to find out as well, because um, isn't, isn't it going to be a little bit conflicting with your work, your legal work, like since you said you work in illegal chambers, 
is it is it permissible to also go into energy? Oh, of course it is. It is? Um, oh, it's, not a, it's not a government law. Okay. You know, if you're working with a government establishment, then mm. you have these restrictions. Oh, okay. But then but if you're working not... in a private establishment, mm. then All these right. restrictions are not there. And okay. I have a boss yeah. that is very supportive. Oh, that's great. Very that's supportive. Man. Sometimes I'm unable to make it to the office you know, to do my work and I'm allowed to work from wherever I am. Okay, cool. So, I think so that's that it. That's, that's, okay, that's beautiful. And I'd also want to tell you, we are here for you as well. So, whenever you want to, um, like you said, to amplify what you've got on ground, I'm sure we could just invite you back over to the conversation and you will be here. No, you let I'm actually quite enjoying this. I'm enjoying having you too and I'm sure somebody sitting out there is like, wow, with 10 more of such brilliant people and young people in Nigeria, we will go places in no time at all. Okay, Zulia let me see. Can you tell us, can I pop my nose a little bit into your privacy? What kind of, how would you describe yourself as a person? Would you say, because I mean, I can see a little bit of um, an ambivalence. You seem shy, but you actually, you, you're actually very articulate. So let me see, how would you describe yourself? Will you say you're... Um, you know, no, it's just really early, I'm camera shy. You're camera shy? Yeah. I'm camera shy, yeah. but um, I get the job done. Right. It's as good as that. Um, right. I, I have a very serious outlook, but I always tell people that deep down inside, I'm a very soft person. Yeah. And I can be quite playful too, but yeah, because okay. I have so many responsibilities, I have so many things I want to achieve in this life. I want to make a name for myself. Um, I'm always on a serious aspect. Yeah. Other than that, if I'm going to use one word to describe myself, I would say I'm a peace setter. Okay. Yes. I would agree with you wholeheartedly. Okay. So where do you see where do you see the NGO being like this? Is, um, let's say five years from now. Let's give it a five-year impact assessment. Five years for from instance, now. yes. For instance, is it going to impact like on that the Garki project you set up? Yes, I actually that? intend to see how to incorporate it. Yes. In fact, um, one of the things we want to do in Garki branch is to yes. have a legal clinic. Okay. That would um, have volunteers, a pool of volunteers of young girls, not just within Garki branch, but across the FCT. Okay. You know, as part of you know those pool of volunteers that would partner directly with NGOs for legal representation yes. especially for in the, one of the SDGs we're trying to focus on is in terms of um, gender equality but oh, particularly SGBV survivors um, you know we don't have enough representation number one number two um, most lawyers don't have the basic training on how to respond to victims you know of violence or abuse and all of that so we want to have trainings for this so that even when you have to interview your client you know and all of that you're sensitive to certain issues you're not just because sometimes we can just be all work 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 and we just want to get the answers out and in doing that we trigger you know um, emotions, emotions in, in, in the victims yeah. we also even want to actually go down to the police stations if possible to also equally speak to them they have gender desk in police stations do a proper training on how to respond to situations like that and you know so i given the fact that we're already planning to run a one-year advocacy um, project on abuse i actually do intend to see how we would do, you know, marry things together in a way just to even amplify the impact and all of that. Oh, uh, that is really, you know why I'm so happy to hear that? Because we have such situations which end, which end up turning victims into into should i say it's scaring victims away because they ask them such crazy questions like um well you 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 come in to complain about getting raped and uh, what were you doing there why were you out exactly. there uh, the, wh wh why did you dress this certain way you know what i'm saying and here is somebody who's you know you're, you're more or less empowering the, 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 the perpetrator because he's like, ha ha ha, look at what has happened to you. You thought you were going to report me. Yes, so I think what you're going to do is really going to be very impactful and will help us tame the monster because now, as it is, we, we, like, it's, it's quite underreported. So if you hear there are 10 cases of rape, they're like 20 more behind, but they're just keeping quiet because they're scared of the stigma. So I think I want to really commend you on what you're doing. Please keep it up. Thank and we'd you. like to see you when we call you again on this program. Please, we'd like to see you 
ASAP coming over to tell us about because I can see in between you're going to achieve a whole lot more. So anyway, that has been a wonderful conversation, if I may say so myself. We've been talking to Zilahat O'Hare, who, let's just summarize everything by saying she's the chairperson of the Young Lawyers Forum NBA Garki branch. And you can, like she's saying, she's, there's so much advocacy going on. I think you can actually reach out to her if you happen to be a victim and you're also in dire straits and unable to get proper legal representation she'll be there for you my name is mickey atan it's been my pleasure bringing the conversation to you i hope you join us again next time on the same station kaftan television for now have a really wonderful day god bless bye, -bye.